Hello, I'm Susan Florey. Welcome to The Big Middle, my podcast changing the conversation about aging in a world fixated on youth. I'm at the Centre for Aging Better in Islington, North London, with a social revolutionary. Jeff Filkin is the chair and founder of the Centre, an independent charitable foundation devoted to all aspects of aging better. Is that the first time you've been called a social revolutionary, Lord Falcon? Um, well, do call me Jeff, and it's probably is the first time I've been called anything as polite as that in my life, so thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad you like the tag. Now, like all card-carrying revolutionaries, you have issued a manifesto. But before we go through it, I'd like you to define the revolution, if you would, the reasons for it, the scale of it. Well, the, the, the central issue is that around the world, uh, people are living much longer. And this is one of the greatest success of our civilization that has ever happened. And yet most of the dialogue about an ageing society tends to be about the fact that there are a lot more older people and how are we going to pay for the cost of that. And that is an issue, but the really big issue is the incredible opportunity of having longer lives. And many people um, in England, in the States, in Europe, around the world even in Africa, will live 10 years longer than their parents' generation did. It's quite astonishing, some of the statistics that are out there and the projections by gerontologists and futurologists, and they're saying that newborns will be living to 110. Well, I've not heard that one, but I certainly when I've had a quiz with my daughter, my granddaughter Freya, and I asked her how long she's going to live, she said, oh, 80. I said, no, keep off the sweets, um, keep (laughs) exercising, you'll make 100. Well, here they say by 2024, more than one in four of us will be over 60. And someone aged 55 now can expect to live to at least 85, 90, if they take good care of themselves. And therein lies the rub. We're healthy older, but not all of us. Longer lives has got two dimensions. One is the enormous opportunity of it. The fact that you know, I, I will continue, I hope, to have many years of relationships with my grandchildren. Yet my parents, I realise, were dead um, several years before my age. I'm 74 now. So that, that opportunity is enormous. But the other side of that is that it's lots of people miss out on that opportunity. There are plenty of people who are doing absolutely and having the time of their life um, in their 60s and the 70s and their 80s. And very many people, unfortunately, die earlier and get ill health or enter into poverty or a lack of relationships much earlier. And that is, I think, the central issue that both our society in England and around the world, I suspect, needs to focus on. How do we make it possible for many more people to enjoy longer lives and have the benefits that those added years give them? Because we've never had an opportunity like that, and yet we're not facing up to it. The potential of it, how marvellous it is, and what we need to change so that more people benefit. Well, there are structural faults throughout society at the moment. If we're talking about the Western developed world, uh, we tend to chuck people out at 50. We lump them into this big demographic, and we say, okay, you're older now. You know, there's a lot of articles about it, and I know the, the Center for Aging Better, you're doing a lot of research and analysis, but structurally, we're moving the retirement age forward all the time, and yet employers are behind the game. They're not in sync with what's happening out there. They still give people in their mid-50s their walking papers and say, okay, let's get the young ones in. And how are people in that demographic going to live from 50 through 70 and beyond? Yes, you've hit it on the head. Clearly, if we're going to live 10 or 15 years longer, we need enough money to keep the standard of living that we've, by and large, got used to. Maybe we shrink out and our expenditure to taste a bit, but most of us don't want to suddenly feel we've got to live in poverty. So we, we will need to um, accumulate more savings and or we'll need to be able to stay in the labour market. And there was, I think 30 years ago, 20 years ago in Britain, the view almost was if you could finish work at 55, that was a good life. And yet we now think that's neither realistic nor is it necessarily the route to happiness. For many people, if they can stay in work, the right sort of work, decent work with interest. Um, They get a lot of well-being and happiness from the work itself. And they continue to contribute to the tax base and they're staying out of the hospitals, they're making more relationships, they're feeding their brains, they're cognitively as sharp as they ever were. There's nothing but upside to this. No, spot on, um, because people um, both benefit from staying in the labour force 
labour market longer if they want to and if they need to. But um, public policy and public expenditure really needs that to happen. And yet, it's a very slow reaction to that reality by governments. You know, in Britain, there's a fuller working life strategy, so it's on the table, but it needs a lot more energy behind it um, so that government really pushes it and really starts to have tough dialogues with employers about you've got to change, you've got to make it possible for people to stay and work longer. And what sort of ways can government encourage employers to do that? Because right now, I mean, I have felt the sharp end of it. All you get are, well, if you get, if you go online and you feed one of your carefully crafted letters into a job advert that you could do with your eyes closed, you don't get a look in, oh, we don't think this would be a good fit. And then if you push harder and try to get an explanation of why it wouldn't be a good fit, you've had such an amazing, impressive career and, well, you'd be bored. And you know that they're going to be hiring a 24-year-old. Yeah. Well, um, to change that problem that many employers um, seem to be negative about employing or keeping older workforce, one's got to look at some of the evidence about why people fall out. And without going into too much detail, people leave work before they want to for about four reasons. They're made redundant, you know, the job goes down the tube suddenly and clearly there's a risk of more of that as digitization happens. Secondly, they have ill health problems which make it difficult for them to keep working. Or thirdly, they have caring problems, such that they've got to look after a sick relative who needs their help. Absolutely. These are the realities of the life cycle. Exactly. And the way we've structured our society. So, But the thing is now, we're not all living according to the same social script. Yeah. You know, we have fragmented families. A lot of families are living well apart. There's none of these support networks, all the rest of you. You get someone who suddenly has their income reduced to nothing, you know, falling into a, a heap yep. and not knowing which way to go. And there's, there's no access to the jobs that might be out there. Yeah, well, um, absolutely right. And addressing your question about what could government do, um, clearly they can start to make it clear to employers that flexible working practices, which is one of the fundamental things, in other words, being able to work flexible hours or have a contract that might be, you know, so many days a month or so many hours a week, Clearly, there's realities of the job that you have to be able to sustain, but being, in principle, willing to have much more flexibility. Outlawing age discrimination, um, and that's already been done in England, doesn't mean it's stopped for a second. Not at all. I mean, people just seem to ignore it willy-nilly. We've got racism and sexism that are being addressed very energetically. Ageism, eh, not so much. Totally right. And we saw that in a recent House of Commons um, Select Committee report, that clearly ageism is is rampant and is not being challenged sufficiently, either by individuals or by some of the public bowlers that should be championing it. So more of that needs to be done and shifted. And then you've also got to address the health issue as well, because many people will have health problems at any age in work. Um, It's too easy when a person's in their 50s and they get a health problem to think, well, they better better retire and to give them the nudge out of work. People need to be given the support and the occupational health support so they can stay in work uh, if that's what they want to do. And I like to call it just, it's, it's probably passing hormonal turbulence. If we're talking about the menopause, you know, once through it, I've been through it, it wasn't easy for me. But now that I'm on the other side of it, I'm as energetic as I ever was. More so because I lift weights, I do intermittent fasting, I follow a lifestyle that keeps my brain sharp and me energetic. Yeah. Well, and again, you've given a nice example because there are lots of things that employers will have to do, lots of things that government will have to do as well, but there's lots of things that we have to do ourselves and some of those are obvious, aren't they? Trying to keep fit, trying to keep healthy, trying to keep active, trying to keep one's brain engaged and recognising, you know, I'm probably on about my sixth career now and one, one will have different careers through life the fact that we'll have a single one. So we have to reinvent ourselves at times, and that's not always easy, um, and it's easier for some than others. Well, do you think there's a gender divide there as well? It's easier for men than women? Depending on what sector said woman has been gainfully employed well, throughout I, I her career? Well, I think there are, um, there are, there are gender um, differentiations across different sectors on employment, undoubtedly. Yes, you know, financial services has traditionally been much more male-dominated, hasn't it, whereas nursing has been, been the reverse. And that's the, it's the patriarchal network as well. Exactly, you know, exactly, yes. People, men in positions of power hire people like them. Yep, and I think the data supports that. I think that um, more women um, 
fall out of the labor out of the labor market earlier than many men. So that that supports that as well, indeed. But as you've signaled, um, employment is a really important issue for having a good later life and being able to stay in work um, in a suitable forms of suitable quality for as long as you want. But there are many other things as well that matter. And it's not just for the food and shelter aspect of it, but it's for your mental health your physiological health and your psychological health. Because if you look, I freelance, I work from home, I'm making this podcast now, I'm yes. reinventing myself to a degree. And I tell you, if you are, you know, wandering the parks, there are a lot of elderly people sitting on benches looking lost. Yeah. Well, it's always a bit cautious about thinking, um, because uh, I can do it, everybody can do it. And one knows that's not true. Uh, because Mrs. Thatcher was the first female prime minister, anybody can be a female prime minister. You know, we know that's a myth because individuals have different um, personalities, different backgrounds, different DNA as well, different DNA, and often very different life chances earlier on, which makes it easier or harder for them. But um, that's a part we do know that what we do ourselves um, has an enormous influence, and even. It, so if we can persuade more people or help more people to recognise that what they do before they are old is going to affect how happy they are in later life. It's lifestyle and it's poverty as well, the two together. And you'll get a similar social class differentiation um, in terms of how long people live and how early they get chronic debilitating illnesses across most Western countries. And it is absolutely... Um, shocking that some people are dying earlier than others and some people get ill health. Well, they were saying in this small northern English town it was the same life expectancy as Ethiopia. Yes. You can't you can hardly believe it, can you? And you look at some of some states in the in USA, you know, it is as bad as that. And you know, American healthy life expectancy is appalling. And you can see why. It certainly is. But those who have wised up to being their own advocates for good health and yeah. before they get too old um, are trying to stave off chronic disease and all of the rest. Um, but we know, of course, just telling people um, don't eat too much and exercise, that doesn't shift the behaviour by itself. But for us, it's one of the central issues on which we will be campaigning for the next 10 years. Um, how, we, how we get much stronger action by government to recognise that we've got to help and support people to live healthier lives before they're older, because they will be happier if they do so. Absolutely. And we need to change the story. We need to change the script because a lot of, I think, these people that are dying early as well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They're, they're 50, they're 55, and they go, oh, well, that's it for me. I think that probably is true in many poorer communities, that that is what, what your expectation is of your later life, that you are old when you're 60, and yet you go to um, other areas or to other people and quite clearly people are still climbing mountains at 70, I hope. I will be when I'm climbing mountains at 75, if, as long as the mountains aren't too big. Well, my... you look like you could do it. You look in very fine fettle, I'm afraid I must I, say. I, and I, pick, I pick the smaller mountains now, so I fail. <laughs> that hill over fail yonder, less. and I'll take the stairs <laughs> twice. Uh, I take the stairs, absolutely, and I, uh, I'm, I'm not allowed to stand on the escalator. Yeah, so you're hurtling up the escalators. What else do you do to live better longer? Personally? Yes. Um, well, again, I'd caution by saying it's easy for me. And it's not the same for many other people. And that other people who may have had tougher lives or, or have significant depressive illnesses or just lost their wives, you're not going to be happy suddenly if that's the, any of those the case. But for me, I think I'm, I'm, and I would be, wouldn't I, I'm aware of what does make for happiness in later life. You know, I kept in paid work till I was nearly 70 and, I, and then I stopped all paid work to take on the chairmanship of the centre. I've been working uh, enjoyably uh, since the last five years as chair of the centre. I don't run it, I'm the chairman of it. Um, but you founded it. Was the um, trigger for that in 2013 when you when your Lord Select Committee and you did your report on yes, ageing? Yes, exactly. Uh, as you say, the House of Lords um, had a Select Committee report on ageing, which I proposed and chaired, that produced a report and one of government's responses was to recommend that there should be a centre for ageing better. And we were then founded and funded by the big lottery fund. So that sort of stuff keeps me very busy. And again, one tries to, you know, I try to walk 10,000 steps a day. I drink too much, but don't tell my wife that. She, <laughs> and I, but, and What's I, too much? 
Oh, yeah, no, I'm, not going to I'm, I'm not going to go into that. Lovely in, Pinot Noir. I'm not going to incriminate myself. In, <laughs> um, the other bit that I think you realise as you get older is, and I've always been far too driven in my work, that it's relationships that count and the relationships of your family and your friends and your kids and your grandkids. And so trying to make more space for them. Uh, that's what gives a glow to you, doesn't it? In this globalised world, though, that's one of the big challenges, isn't it? Because families are all over the place. It is. I've just had my uh, my lovely youngest daughter go to Berlin to live for two years, and I think that's great for them and the family and rotten for me. But I'm realising I must send her a tweet or a text every other day and, and talk on the phone with her at least once a week so that I would never have done that when she was in London, but I think I can find ways using the technology to keep more in touch with her, even though she's um, a thousand miles away. And have your go bag ready to take those short hop flights. At least she's not in Shanghai or somewhere. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. What can you do or what have you done to encourage employers to not just you know, pitch over 50s onto this generic scrap heap? Well, the centre's been working on that for uh, about two years and we've just committed that's going to be our goal for at least the next five or ten years. In five years' time, we want to see a million more people in work in that age cohort. There's a range of things that we're doing. We're working closely with employers and with employers' organisations to find out how you do good, uh, flexible workplace practice so that the work practice is friendly to older people, what works in terms of personnel practices and how do you do that. But how are you connecting with the cohort that's out there trying to get jobs and, you know, there are these programs, Work 50 Plus with a bit of EU funding yep. behind it, and we're talking about low-skilled jobs. Yep. You know, if you have a career full of achievements, where are these recruitment centres and headhunters that can help you out? Employment agencies yeah. you mentioned. Well, good question, because I suspect that many of the employment agencies tend to think that their focus is on younger people. That's certainly where government policy is. You know, in terms of getting people back into work or getting into work, all the focus is on young people. Nothing wrong with that, but they th th tend to write off thinking getting people back into work in their 50s. Now, that's often quite difficult if people have been out of the labour market for a long period of time. But trying to get people back in within a year of falling out of the labour market ought to be a really strong push by government and employment bodies, both public and private sector. Well, I, I just know from personal experience, my company was privatised. So it was nothing I did. I had my own radio show, national radio show, loved it. It was lovely, after years of television reporting and presenting, to get back to radio and to really connect with the listeners and have complete autonomy over my programming, yes. you know, extemporising for four hours a day, interaction, all the rest of it. And then I took a year out to do something that interested me, an architectural design course. And then I wanted to get back in my original game, the career that I'd had for 30 years. And I remember one of the big business channels, I talked to the HR people and she said, oh, well, we're really only interested in people that are in the industry now. I said, hang on a minute, 30 plus years experience. And I've taken a year out because I'm a curious person. I want to keep learning. And you're telling me that because I took one year out to pursue an interest, I'm suddenly not of interest to you? That's when I've run newsrooms, yeah. I've been a managing editor. Shocking. Yeah, shocking, shocking. And she didn't see anything wrong with it. We're really looking for people that are actually doing that job yeah. now. Or well, the assumption that only younger people can be in touch with markets, products, needs and services. Because that's the other flip side. You, you don't persuade business by shouting at it. You've got to persuade business through thinking there's a bottom line benefit to it. One is they're going to need more labour market. They're going to need more older people to stay in the labour market because there's an enormous reduction. The inverted age pyramid, I was exactly. just going to bring that up. And secondly, there's an enormous goal, um, later, later life market, which many firms are still ignoring. Well, advertisers, you yes. may as well be invisible. There's this cloak of invisibility that society wraps you up in the minute that you've got your, your grey hair, it seems. Exactly. And you see the cruise ships and you get ads. I know my Facebook... I end up getting ads for copper insoles. You know, what? That's, that's what is that all about? That's pretty sexy, isn't it? Yeah, on my way to do a body <laughs> pump class for an hour. <laughs> and you just think, oh, hang on a minute. I haven't yet had the adverts for the coffins, but they'll be coming soon, I expect. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pick that up, the inverted age pyramid. There are not enough young people, let's just look at the UK alone, coming into the labour market. And we've got all of these plus 50s that are sitting at home languishing. Exactly. 
let alone the problems that Brexit will cause us in terms of labour supply. So there's a, a real crisis that most firms in Britain haven't yet woken up to. They're going to have very significant labour and skill shortages. And what's the answer to that? The answer to that is treat your 50 pluses much more seriously as a great asset of knowledge and experience and commitment and make it possible for them to stay in work longer. But are you doing anything practical and organized and coherent to make this happen? You know, rounding up all of the people, all of the corporate leaders, titans, the city, for instance, getting them well, together and saying, look, this is happening. So why is yes, up to do, it? Yes, Wake up to it. Yes, we're doing a lot that's practical. Um, first of all, we're making a big challenge to government to treat this much more seriously because government has considerable powers and potential. To address this. Secondly, uh, we have strong relationships with employers' organisations and we've pushed it onto their agenda. And we're making them realise, again, by making the business case to them, you've got to make the business case to them. You can't make a corporate social responsibility case if you expect to get really serious attention. And then thirdly, we're doing real life work in places like Greater Manchester to see what does it take to get people who are out of work in their 50s back into work and what works in terms of changing employment support and training support and health support so that it's more likely more of them will be able to get back into the labour market. Do you work with this government-appointed champion of business for older workers? Oh, indeed. Yes, no, he's, he's a great asset. Government needs to use him more. They need to support him more. And the benefit of him, of course, is that firms will listen to um, the chief executive of a FTSE 100 company in the way they won't listen to... Um, the well, it's chief... Andy Briggs, isn't it? Andy He's Briggs. with Aviva. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I was listening to uh, a programme that he was on and I just uh, pencilled down some facts and he was saying that a lot of the myths that are out there, he was just knocking them down one by one and saying over 50s are less than half as likely to take a sick day as a 20 to 25-year-old. Yeah. Over 50s five times less likely to leave or change jobs as 25 to 30 year olds. And he went on into this area that's very interesting to me about cognitive ability and how we all become less sharp in our 20s. That's when it starts declining. But you acquire so many other skills as you age, skills about organization, larger vocabularies, greater bodies of knowledge that you, you can pass on if you're given the chance to do so. No, he's great, and he's doing good work and needs to keep doing it. I'd be interested in your thoughts on the language of ageing. Are you doing anything around that, trying to get advertisers to address the negativity and the stereotyping that goes on? We've done most of the work in conjunction with World Health Organization on this, who is trying to launch a, a global campaign against ageism. And I think that's the platform through which we'll do our work. We could put all of our resources into that, and it would it would not make a big dent. So I think that we're going to make most impact if we walk in step with the World Health Organization on that. If you look at some aspects of television, it's beginning to reflect that, both in terms of presenters and in terms of program content. But there's a heck of a long way to go. It still is an assumption that old is bad and young is good. And it's an assumption, unfortunately, that we carry in ourselves as well. So we we have our own internal ageism problem, don't we? Absolutely. If, you know, if I say to a friend, you're looking young today, they're happy. They don't say, what a cheek, I should be looking old, because old is good. We just need to stop this. This is how we look at this age. Get uh, used to it. Well, if you, if you look at some people, some older people can look absolutely beautiful, can't they? It isn't true. And some younger people, how can I put this delicately without getting shot, can look a bit bland, can't they? Yeah, yeah. it's all genes and lifestyle choices. Exactly. Absolutely. And luck. I'm afraid luck. And luck. Yeah, luck is a huge one as well. So we know that medical advances combined with better public health and living standards have given us extra years of life and all of the other factors that decide how many years you get. I really love this line from your website. Now we must add life to those years. How do you feel about all of the initiatives that you are doing trying to add life to these years? Well, I think that we feel... Um, we've got a great responsibility and a great opportunity. And the responsibility is because these are very big changes that we need to make to shift attitudes and behaviours across all of society. We have had a lot of impact on government in our two years. They take this more seriously, but it's not owned by anybody in government. And that's true across most governments around the world. It tends to be you know, an issue that is a bit on everybody's agenda. We've developed a strategy which sets out clearly 
what we're going to do over the next 10 years. And we are fortunate that we've got 10 years of funding to go at this. It's got four key elements, four big changes that we want to promote over the next 10 years to make it possible for many more people to live healthy lives and active lives before they are old, which may sound strange, but doing those things before you're old is what's most likely to lead to health and happiness in later life. Secondly, as we've touched at length, to keep in the labour market as long as they can, as long as they want to, in suitable, flexible work. Thirdly, to live in a home and an environment that supports them in their own ageing and thinking about that and planning for that before they get old. And lastly, to be able to help people to recognise the benefits of keeping involved so that one isn't uh, uh, isolated. Now, it's difficult for some people, I grant, but the more we, the more we volunteer, the more we um, are active socially, um, culturally, in our own lives, in our own neighbourhoods, the evidence is the happier we will be. And so recognising that going for it is something that's probably even more important when we're 70 than when we're 17. Absolutely. So we need the community network, the community structure. That support all that. To reach out to all of the people Absolutely. who are languishing at home and maybe just need you know, an energetic someone to come and knock on the door and get them out and get them involved. Absolutely. Is age discrimination worse, do you think, here in the UK than the rest of the West? Uh, this is a low-wage economy, and my sense is that over 50s are seen as, as cheap labour. They're lagging behind Canada, the US, most developed European economies on this score. Well, it, I don't think in London it feels a low-wage economy for some. You know, there's, a, there's enormous levels of wealth <laughs> Um, in bits of the economy. The upper uh, 10%, though. Yeah, uh, but clearly uh, there are low wages um, and too low wages in many parts of it. Is there any country that you can identify, let's say, even just going across the channel to Europe, saying they're doing it right? In terms of what? Age discrimination in I, I, general, taking care of their ageing population. I don't think there's one country that we have found which is doing a full agenda. Enormous amount of interesting work being done in Japan because they've got such a, a very large older population and such a very long living population. So they are probably some of the best pioneers. Um, in terms of social policy and ageing and helping people, it's a very mixed picture across Europe. That's why, again, we are keen to we enjoy working with World Health Organization to learn from other countries and hopefully in time to share our learning with them as well. Thanks so much for coming on The Big Metal, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. Good to meet you. Best of luck in your work. Thank you. Jeff Filkin is the chair and founder of the Centre for Ageing Better, an independent charitable foundation in the UK devoted to all aspects of ageing better now that we're all living longer. Find the Centre for Ageing Better at aging-better.org.uk. You'll find interesting articles, research, analysis there, and uh, get across the Centre's various initiatives. And you can find The Big Middle at SusanFlory.com. Do say hello on Twitter and Facebook. Subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you can. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.